speaker, Dr. Ryder from United Kingdom, who is uh, presenting uh, his work entitled Endoscopic Duodenal Jejunal Bypass Liner Treatment for Type 2 Diabetes and Obesity, comparing 9 versus 12 month implantation in a worldwide registry. Please. Thank you very much. I'm Dr. Bob Ryder from Birmingham in the United Kingdom. These are my disclosures. And I'm talking about the duodenal jejunal uh, bypass liner, also known as endobarrier or reset. Um, uh, it's been most known as endobarrier over the years, so I'm going to use that term. Uh, and this is an endobarrier here, I'm holding it up. Um, it's an impermeable sleeve implanted during a simple endoscopy procedure into the first part of the small intestine, such that the food passes through the, uh, the, the sleeve rather than the small intestine, and it mimics the bypass bit of the Roman Y uh, bariatric procedure. Um, in view of uncertainty about the risks versus the benefits of endobarrier, during 2017, an independent secure online registry was established under the auspices of the Association of British Clinical Diabetologists for the collection of safety and efficacy data of endobarrier treated patients worldwide. Uh, the outcomes uh, from the registry were published in Diabetes Care in, in April last year. Um, uh, but many of the serious adverse events associated with end barrier occurred during the last three months of treatment. Uh, and we considered whether the possibility would be that if we reduce the implantation to nine months, would this reduce the complication rate? So we aim to assess the safety and efficacy for nine months versus 12 months implantation uh, of endobarrier using data in the registry. Uh, as of September last year, data had been entered into the registry on 1,068 endobarrier treated patients of whom 2014 had both nine month and 12 month data. And that's those 2014 of the patients we are analyzing here. Uh, and these were their baseline characteristics and I point out in particular uh, the mean BMI uh, of over 40. Um, uh, and this is what happened from the endobarrier treatment. Uh, they lost over 12 kilograms in weight and the hemoglobin A1C dropped from uh, uh, 8.6 to 7.1. But you note there's no statistically significant difference between the weight or the hemoglobin A1C at nine months compared to 12 months. Uh, the higher the hemoglobin A1C, the greater the fall, uh, so that, for instance, if the hemoglobin A1C was greater than 3%, the fall was 3% or more. Um, uh, but again, you can see no significant difference between the, uh, the fall in hemoglobin A1C at nine months versus 12 months. Uh, so the question is, how many serious adverse events would be avoided by reducing the in-pan period to nine months? Um, and basically, in the full registry, uh, there were 45 serious adverse events, 4.2%. All of these patients made a full recovery and most experienced benefits despite the serious adverse events. Uh, but it was noteworthy that uh, 15 of the 45 or a third would have been avoided by removal at nine months. And that was nine liver abscess cases, five gastrointestinal hemorrhages, and one cholecystitis. Uh, and it was particularly noteworthy that nine of the 14 liver abscess serious adverse events would have been avoided by removal at nine months. And this is the actual data behind what I've just said. And you can see uh, 30 adverse events before nine months uh, 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 and uh, f f uh, another 15 after nine months. And uh, nine of the 14 uh, liver abscess cases occurred uh, in the last three months. Uh, and this is some real patients from my service uh, using endobarrier. You can see that by nine months, this gentleman has gone from a hemoglobin A1C of 12.1% to 5.8%, and he's lost 23 kilograms. Uh, this lady here ha ha had an improvement in the glycemia, a, a considerable weight loss, but also normalization of her alanine amino transferase as a marker of liver fat, but that had already occurred by nine months. Uh, this lady here was on a continuous positive airway pressure ventilation uh, uh, for obstructive sleep apnea. Um, and you can see with the weight reduction, 
uh, there was improvements in glycemic control and a, a big redu reduction in the insulin requirement, but she no longer required uh, this, the, the CPAP, which for her was a marvelous uh, thing to happen. This lady here, as well as having a, 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 an improvement in glycemic control and a big reduction in insulin, had an improvement in her renal function, and that had occurred by nine months. Uh, and this lady here, you can see, uh, went from a hemoglobin A1C of 13.9% uh, and morbid obesity with an insulin requirement of 260 units a day. And by 12 months, uh, she no longer required insulin. Her BMI had normalized, but you could see most of the improvement had already occurred by, by nine months. Uh, and this lady here um, uh, had a, a liver abscess uh, during the last three months, one of my patients, uh, and that would have been avoided had she had the endobarrier removed at nine months, by which time her hemoglobin A1C had dropped to 6.8%. So in conclusion, our data confirms the effectiveness of endobarrier at reducing weight and hemoglobin A1C. The higher the baseline hemoglobin A1C, the greater the fall, with a mean fall of 3% or more when the baseline hemoglobin A1C is greater than 10%. Reducing the implantation period from 12 months to 9 months resulted in no significant difference in the weight loss or in the improvements in hemoglobin A1C, but a third reduction in the serious adverse event rate. And in particular, it was noteworthy that over 60% of the liver abscess serious adverse events would have been avoided by removal at 9 months. These data support a change in the recommended implantation period for endobarrier from 12 months to 9 months. And as endoscopy units are ubiquitous in health services, uh, delivery of endobarrier treatment would be relatively straightforward. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Your presentation is now, is now open to discussion. Any question from the audience? Please. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I'm slightly worried about, uh, about this because what, what you've got is a continuous group of people that you're taking a cut off and what you don't know is if you pulled it out at nine months in these people that they wouldn't have gone on to get a liver abscess and there are recorded cases in the literature of people once the endobarrier has been taken out that they still went on to get liver abscesses um, so I think it's a dangerous I can see what you're trying to do but yes. I think it's a dangerous thing to do in a continuous data with it's the same people that you're actually doing it on so I think I, I would treat the, the evidence with caution. I think the other difficulty with the weight is that you're using the mean rather than the peak for each individual. And it might well be that there are many people that their peak weight loss was actually at 12 months. But by using the mean, you're actually seeing that saying actually it's fine to actually only go to nine months. So I, I think I would have slight worry and I certainly, if I was sitting on a FDA board or things, I wouldn't say that this is clear evidence that to, to change it from 12 to nine months. So just in terms of a trialist. Yeah. I'm not sure that that many liver abscesses occurred after removal of the device. Oh, there are. Because, because <laughs> <laughs> there's, no, there's nothing to say that it's the process of actually still having it in. Yes. That, because it, it's, I mean, it's the it's, process it's, of it's, actually it's going in, on. It's, it's covered in bacteria and things, and once it's out, I think possibly in, in, in a, few, a, few, a small number of days after removal, but uh, after that, uh, I'm not so convinced. Yeah, I'll send you a few <laughs> abstracts. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, so we can move to the next speaker. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much.